Glad to know you're still there. It's time now to go to the press and see what the headlines are on some of our national dailies. And we're being joined by Mr. Tunde Kolaole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolaole. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Yes. Mm. Congratulations. We are 25 years uh, as a democratic nation, you know. But you know, I'm not saying we haven't done democracy before, but uninterrupted democracy, we've had it for 25 years. So happy anniversary to you as a Nigerian. Hello. I'm just saying happy anniversary to you. Uninterrupted democracy, we've had it for 25 well, years. Well, I think we need to congratulate ourselves mm. in the sense that... Uh, We've been practicing this democracy since 1999, and it has not been interrupted. We are not yet there, but we are great. I mean, we are growing uh, gradually. And like I have always said, no matter how bad the democracy is, it seems to be better than an armed rule in which you don't have a choice. So Nigerians need to clap for themselves as regards uh, how long we have uh, been able to manage this democracy since 1999. I don't know. This is um, not on the headlines today, but you know, we're talking about uh, uh, civil rule, and then we are compared, you just compared it to uh, military rule that we do not have a say. Uh, yet, um, a few days ago, we heard that uh, virtually the, the president commissioned or reopened cutting tape uh, of the third mainland bridge that was built by a military administration. Uh, he refurbished it in, uh, after 32 years or more uh, of that uh, bridge's e existence and then still cut the tape, you know. So I don't know which, which is which right now. A, a military administration will do something and then a, a civilian administration will come and use it as part of the dividends of democracy and uh, delivering on governance uh, to the people and still doing a fanfare over things like that. I don't know. Can you hear me, Mr. Kolaole? Well, like I said, it is still better than armed rule. Oh, no, no. We reach a few airlines. Yeah. We we'll just move the weapon, but for them, my whole thing will be passed there. And we get the news that they impose their will. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I sincerely apologize for the background noise. It's unavoidable uh, because of uh, some circumstances. Uh, Mr. Tunde Kulawole has to be where he is right now to uh, be a part of our program. So when you hear the din um, uh, behind him, you should just bear with us. Um, we're going to make the best of it. And uh, Mr. Kulawole, the, the, the screaming headline on all the newspapers is about the one-year anniversary of uh, the Tinubu administration. And it is one year of the Tinubu administration building a safer, stronger, and prosperous Nigeria. That is the story. It's on The Punch, it's on The Guardian, and uh, some other newspapers. So what would be your scorecard for the, um, the present administration? Right on top of this one-year anniversary of uh, this administration, we have federal government plans, cash transfer for a scheme for uh, 75 million Nigerians. And we've seen a lot of other things that this administration has said that they have done and they are going to do and they have been doing and all that. So what would be your scorecard like for the present administration? and some other newspapers. Those ones are adverts. They are paid for by the government. It's the government that has put those uh, adverts on the front page of those papers. So we cannot speak that as a yardstick to measure the performance of the government. Then and I will know that the government is not likely to say anything adverts against itself. When you look at the punch, it has a beautiful editorial on the performance of the present administration. We talked about um, security, 
he talks about food, he talks about inflation, and so many other areas of our life. And then at the end of that editorial, the conclusion is that uh, the performance of the present administration is not as far with their expectations and the planning of the average Nigerian people. If I'm going to give a government a fact, I would rather say that uh, they have no average. But what the picture of them is, I will say. Okay, um, like I said, the audio is, is quite bad. Uh, we'll be taking comments as much as we can from uh, Mr. Tunde Kolaole until it is um, unbearable, just like it, it was in a moment ago. But uh, we'll, we'll just reel out some of these uh, headlines that we have on these dailies. Uh, on Punch newspaper, as you can see displayed, uh, is the Tilibu's first anniversary gift. Federal government plans fresh cash transfer scheme for 75 million Nigerians. Uh, I don't know um, which, which Nigerians get this, but those who get the, the money, congratulations to you. Um, well, Emirate Tussle, there's a small headline up there, top right corner. And you can read the story on page 3. Emirates tussle by Aero stays as court gives conflicting orders on San Lucy. When we are able to get a hold on uh, Mr. Kola Wale again, we'll, I'll ask him, being a legal mind himself, uh, to tell us what is really happening. Why the same, the courts of the same status will be giving conflicting orders and who are we to obey and all that. Minimum wage talks collapse again as labor rejects 60,000 naira. So from 47 or so to 54,000. And then from that, you, we, they went now to 58,000, I think, now, or 57,000. And now they are at 60,000. The labor is asking for above 400,000 naira. We don't know where this is going to end. Like they say, uh, when two elephants fight, the grass will suffer. The people of Nigeria are the grass in this case, and then the two elephants are the government and uh, organized labor, the labor leaders or labor unions. On the Guardian newspaper, it is written, Opposition loyalists bicker over Tinubu's performance and outlook. You can read that on page 6 of the Guardian newspaper. Right under that major headline, we have another strike looms as Labour rejects federal government's fresh 60,000 naira wage offer. Uh, where is President Tinubu's renewed hope agenda? That's an editorial that you can read on page 16. 4,416 persons killed, 4,334 abducted under Tinubu report reveals. And that probably is official figures. Uh, there are some that we may not even know about. Uh, Kanu royal crisis gets messier as court issues conflicting orders. That is on page 9 of uh, that publication, the Guardian newspaper. Okay, so uh, on, on that news about um, the one year of Tinubu administration, which we also found on the Punch newspaper, which says building a safer, stronger, and prosperous Nigeria, there's some graphic display of what, uh, what reforms have come. The Renewed Hope Agenda priority areas are economic reforms for sustained growth, uh, strengthening national security, uh, boosting agriculture for food security, unlocking energy and natural resources, enhancing infrastructure and, transform and transportation, education, health, and social investment, and then economic reforms for sustained growth, improving governance. You know, of all these ones, Nigerians are the judge for it. How much has this government done to show you that they are on the right track to achieving uh, these uh, reforms? These are one, two, they are up to um, eight uh, points agenda. Economic reforms, how well have they fared according to your opinion? Uh, strengthening national security, how much have they done in your own opinion? And then boosting agriculture for food security. What is a, a, a mudu or a paint robber of Gary right now? Uh, maybe that's not how economy is measured anyway, or food security is measured. Uh, unlocking energy and natural resources. How much has the government done? Are you in band A or B or C or rubber band or band Z? 
enhancing infrastructure and transportation. I don't know much about transportation, but I've heard that uh, something is in the grapevine about housing, and I do hope that uh, it's going to come off. Previous administrations have done uh, not much about housing, at least not much that we know. Uh, the few housing units that uh, were built by some uh, administrations before now were taken over by the rich because the poor could not, even though it's low cost housing, the, the poor could not get this housing. And we're looking forward to a time where everybody can get affordable housing. Now we heard news about uh, a particular group of people who went and made uh, uh, houses or rooms under the bridge somewhere and were charging up to 250,000 naira for these rooms, you know. People are creative, you know. So, but the, the bottom line is people are outside. People are sleeping under the bridge without necessarily having rooms. People are sleeping on top of the bridge. Some people are sleeping on the pavements, even uh, where, where we are right now on the island that is supposed to be like, you know, the, one of the best places in Nigeria. Uh, we see people early in the morning, people are just sleeping on the pavements, on just the walkways everywhere and you ask yourself if they are sleeping on the on the road in this kind of a place even when it is raining they just cover themselves with uh, polythene bags some of them sleep in trucks some of them sleep under some outrageous kinds of places and in the morning they get up and they go about their normal businesses as if nothing happened some of them don't even have uh, opportunity or access to water that they can take their bath but we are all in the center of excellence. You go to Bridges, you go to Oshodi, you go to other places, you find people just sleeping there. They have to make ends meet. Now, how those people came uh, to that uh, state of being, I don't know. I, don't, I, I can't say, uh, but it is happening. Whether they did the right thing and they're still the way they are, or they did the wrong thing and they're still the way they are, I, I don't know. I'm not a judge for that, but it's happening in the center of excellence. So we should think about uh, affordable housing and having in mind people who may not be able to afford 15 million at a go or 25 million at a go because if that is the cost of housing then a lot of people will still be under the bridge and on the pavements. Education, health and social investment, the Nigerians are the best judge of that. Is education cheaper and better now or do you see a blueprint or a roadmap uh, towards achieving this? Economic reforms for sustained growth, are we growing or going backwards? And improving governance, yeah. And then we have more ministries now than we've ever had in our history, more than 40 ministries now. And we're hoping that after four years, something will be achieved. And we hope also that we are going to leave uh, for those four years and we're not, nothing is going to happen to us uh, because of hunger or starvation. Now, we also have Nature News, Nature Newspaper. Remember that today we just have Nature News Punch and The Guardian. Uh, okay, we have the business NG. On Nature News, we have how Lagos utilizes uh, 15 billion naira four-year ecological fund. So if you're concerned about uh, this fund that gets to them, 15 billion uh, four-year ecological fund, you can find that report on page three of Nature News. Uh, Kaduna government distributes farm inputs to 40,000 farmers. And that is a good thing. If 40,000 farmers actually get farm inputs and they use them well, I'm sure that uh, something will be done in the right direction um, in terms of uh, food security. We also know of uh, another state um, in the north that uh, so much is being done about agriculture. He got um, tractors for so many hundreds and hundreds of tractors that farmers can use. I think if this is done in every state that is agrarian enough, then we will see a boost in the production of uh, agricultural uh, products, you know. Now we find that tomato, a, a, a basket of tomato is up to 150,000 naira. Even though someone has come out to say that it's because of some uh, diseases that are, uh, are the tomato you know, planters or uh, farmers are experiencing on the tomato itself. That's why there's shortage and all that. But 150,000 naira is quite much if you compare that to what used to be obtainable 
a uh, few months ago. So if every government does something about or, to, or with farmers or to farmers, we know that there will be improvement in uh, the production of food items in Nigeria. And that is the, the basic thing. If people can feed and feed well, uh, there are a lot of things that they might overlook. But if they are hungry, and then you're coupling that with a lot of other things that are going wrong, uh, you know, by the perception of the people, then we don't know what that will lead us. We know that if you buy fertilizer or you give fertilizer, for instance, to farmers, even if that farmer carries that fertilizer and sells to another person, he will sell to a farmer that will still use it. So it is not something that uh, we can say, okay, it is going to waste. Some people are going to uh, misuse it. You can't use fertilizer for anything else but to grow some things. So you can't use it to drink Gary. That is not possible. You will, you will either use it on your farm or you will sell it out to another farmer that will use it on their farm. So if the government of every uh, state is doing this, I think it will be very, very good. So that is on Nature newspaper. And on um, the Business NG, um, we're seeing Naira slide threatens Nigeria's $1 trillion dream. $1 trillion is what we're hoping that our economy will uh, get up to. But now Naira is sliding. Uh, it got back to 1,002 or so, 1,001 something, and everybody was clapping, and we all were asked to clap that the Central Bank of Nigeria was doing something really, really good. And we were also applauding on the show here and saying whatever they're doing, they should keep doing it and doing it well, so that as the Naira is rising and dollar is crashing, it will continue like that until maybe we will get to where we were at the time of Jodotan, uh, at least. Because once upon a time, we had that, uh, when a, a lot of people were saying that president was one of the worst presidents we've ever had in Nigeria. The Naira was like 200 Naira to a dollar or something like that. Uh, it didn't go above 300 Naira, I think. And then even in Buhari's time, that everybody was saying, oh, it's even the worst government. We had the Naira, you know, fluctuating from 600 Naira to 700 Naira. And I'm not sure it got to 800 Naira in the official market. But now it went to as far as uh, 2,000 in some people in, in the black market there is, that is, and 1,800 and so on. And it crashed. It came down or it, it went higher where we had like 1,200 to a dollar. And now it's 1,005 and it could be more. I haven't checked the exchange rate for today. So something should be done about it because investors also are looking at this Naira stability to do the investment they need to do 290 million naira scandal rocks culture ministry mm. from humanitarian to culture ministry and i bet you all the ministries will have one one thing or the other um, maybe not intentional that the ministers want to take this money but just that uh, the system has been bastardized so much so that nobody even checks there are some withdrawals that should be done in banks and the EFCC is alerted and they ask questions, but it gets to a point where some money will just be missing and after a while we, we say, okay, this money is missing and who is involved? Uh, we mention one or two people and at the end of the day, we don't see anybody being jailed or anybody returning the full sum. Uh, you'll just have a plea bargain and then out of 290 million maybe, you will be asked to bring 90 million and 200 is gone. That's what we see. I'm not saying that's what really happens, but that's what we see. But if something else happens, Nigerians need to know that this is what happens. And then we will talk advisedly that this is what actually happened because we know that it happened and we have the evidences of all that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kolawole, are you there? Yes, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Yes, we'll just take maybe uh, one one question and then uh, we we wrap it up because our time has really been spent. Now, yes, now this question is um, on uh, the Emirates tussle. Bayero stays as court gives conflicting orders on Sanusi. We, I get confused as an individual. A court, maybe a high court in one place is giving an order, another high court and in another place is giving an order, which one should we obey? Why does, uh, why does, does it always happen this way uh, in the Nigerian legal system? Is it something that should happen? And if it shouldn't happen, why is it happening and we're letting it slide? Well, it's uh, rather very, very unfortunate. Both the federal court 
and they cannot set high scores are so to stay on the same level. Mm -hmm. There are courts that have a component uh, jurisdiction. Not one is higher than the other. And as such, they are not supposed to be giving conflicting judgments um, with regards to this uh, social for the ownership of uh, of uh, Kano. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's good to say that this is a very big embarrassment uh, for the Nigerian judiciary. So if you look back at uh, the issue of the Nigerian judiciary, this will not be the first time that this is happening. Mm. Uh, to return to this uh, civil We have seen this to happen in uh, electoral petitions and the election uh, issues that are before court. And some other cases involving high profile individuals in the society. The truth of the matter is that uh, uh, it is the politicians that are behind uh, this. And that is why people like me have always uh, said that uh, the judiciary, especially the lawyers and the judges, should be very, very wary of whatever cases that the politicians are bring to them. They should be very, very wary of whatever um, uh, rulings and injunctions that they might be given. They should be very wary of allowing the politicians to politicize the justice system. Because once the justice system is politicized, the nation will be away. And anarchy will be the next step uh, that the nation might find itself uh, uh, taken. Uh, well, it is not uh, too late. The judiciary has a way of uh, correcting itself. The judiciary has a way of discipline. Whoever may have gone as case during the processes of either seeking for justice or defending themselves um, uh, in court, or even litigating, or ensuring or pursuing their rights. In the different course. I am sure they are perfect time, and when the thought of all these aspects, uh, appropriate actions will be taken as regards to whoever may be comfortable in this conflicting um, the region that we are doing. But I must emphasize that the Nigerian Justice, the Nigerian Judicial Council, and the APS Court, which is um, the Supreme Court, especially my law, the Chief Justice of the Federation, as well as emphasize that our court is very, very careful in whatever injustice that they might be. At any particular point. So as not to bring the judiciary into ridicule and into the kind of um, embarrassment that uh, this kind of decision really coming from the court of fame, I mean, of the concurrent decision is making in Kano with regards to this emergency for social in, um, in uh, Kano. Well, lastly, this is a digital age, I understand, but uh, is, it, is it covered by law? We know that, you know, it's a digital age, like I said. Is it covered by law that a judge, if it is true what the governor said, a judge can stay in America and make a pronouncement of an issue here in Nigeria? Um, let me say, with the uh, advocacy that we have in our hands to say, uh, it is not impossible or the law may not seriously stand at it. If a judge is outside um, his jurisdiction, begin to give rulings or to hear cases uh, online. I have once done a case, I'm sorry to use this example, in which uh, the judge was in Abuja, and then the litigant and the lawyer were in Lagos, and then the judge delivered his ruling from Abuja uh, through um, uh, the electronic uh, media and all that. But the challenges we have now in our hands is regarding whether somebody can be in America, not within Nigeria, not within the borders of Nigeria, and begin to hear cases from America and delivering or giving injunctions or ruling from America. That raises on the problem. We want to see, look at what the law says as regards um, whether this opportunity or this leeway that um, the practice procedure has given the judges allows them to sit outside the confines of the country to begin to react to it and then deliver it. Furthermore, the other problematic area is uh, the judges in America, what is it in there? Is he on hospital assignment? Is he on vacation? Is he... Uh, uh, on um, a kind of um, uh, attending some workshops and seminars and all that. If it's, um, if it's an official assignment, which does not take away from him the opportunity to sit um, in his court 
or even to hear cases uh, where the electronic media and other, then there may be no problem. But if the judge is on vacation, or if it's um, uh, on um, sick leave, or it's on some other assignment that has nothing to do with the function of the office, or if it's on vacation and all that, then it could not be said that he could be delivering or could be any cases and delivering rulings in America. Uh, we are the electronic media. More importantly, too, when you look at um, the, the hierarchy of our court and then the jurisdictions of the court and all that, ordinarily when it comes to citizenship matter, it is the customary court and the high court of the state that should be hearing cases of citizenship matter. But the reason why this case may be taken to the federal court might be because the security agency, the general of police, the army, the DSS, and all manner of security apparatus. We are involved in the case. We also see that many times there are some key and war as well. So with that as it may, even if that is the case, if the security agents are involved and all that, not to preclude the state high court from hearing this emergency social cases that um, is going on um, in casino today. So by and large, it would have been better. The state high court and the customary court in Canada will have had a better jurisdiction as the guys who have the power to hear the case uh, that is not causing one point all over um, uh, the country. If you ask me for my own opinion, my own um, perception would be it should have been tied here for a customary court or a high court in Canada to hear this case. It should also have been tied here if my most. Um, uh, for the federal high court in Kano has declined jurisdiction over this matter because it's outside the country. Because uh, most of our court, when you look at the law, the country establishing the court, then you also look at certain laws of the land and all that. It specifies the area, the boundaries. You see which court to the practice. I mean, we think which court has a jurisdiction over. This jurisdiction doesn't have a statutory uh, and the court as we have seen with respect to this uh, case. Uh, for example, a judge who is sitting in Canada cannot decide over a case that is uh, emanating from uh, another state, for example, or that is emanating from uh, Lagos, for example. So if this is the case or another, you might as well extend that to say, no, if a judge is outside his jurisdiction, he ought not to be hearing cases and giving ruling from outside of the jurisdiction. But if you receive jurisdiction and the case comes up and is unable to go to the court of the over the case, he could sit in his uh, studies at home and hear the cases, or sit in his chamber and hear the cases and deliver his uh, ruling. Uh, whatever way you look at it, what is coming from Kano is not ideal at all. But I'm sure the uh, NJC and then my Lord, the chief judge of the petition, will take the appropriate action when this matter eventually lands on their table. I think we will just we'll just give ourselves more time and talk more things about what is happening. So just don't go away, uh, uh, Mr. Kola Wale. Uh, we have we have so many things to discuss now. They can't wait. Okay. So uh, like let, let's look at this. Um, what government plans to do? Tinubu's first anniversary gift. Federal government plans fresh cash transfer scheme for 75 million Nigerians. What is your take? Honestly speaking. As much as I sympathize with the Shamsodi, the poor people, those who are living below the minimum uh, uh, wage in the country, I will still want to say that I haven't seen the impact that this kind of transfer has made in the lives of our, of our people. This transfer thing has been going on since the Gwari administration. And when you look at the poverty index in the country and all that, that we get to see, we get to hear that we just get, get, get to reach in the mass window on a daily basis. It has had no significant impact on the lives of our people. Rather, what it does is that when the money gets into the hands of these traders and people, uh, artisans and others, they manage this to buy food items, to buy food stock, and then to pay their house, uh, and then they get things back into their poverty. Uh, as it is said in the Bible, I would rather prefer a situation in which we teach the people how to fish rather than give them pieces of uh, uh, fish to eat. Which after they are visiting, they revert back or they get back to the poverty level in which they have been beginning. Let's use the cash transfer the money to create jobs. Let's use the cash transfer money to 
rely on agriculture, let's use the cash and farm money to provide security in this country. Those who have provided security and then uh, improved or revive agriculture and what have you, we will be on the path to really elevating the poverty of our people. Other than this handout, this second uh, uh, kit uh, uh, that we give to the ordinary Nigerian people periodically, which to neither bring them out of their poverty or make any meaningful impact in their, in their lives. Mm. And uh, while, while we are talking about the cash transfer, uh, we see labor demanding uh, money and then the federal government offering, you know, 5,000, 3,000, 2,000, like that. Now the federal government has reached 60,000 naira as minimum wage and the labor is asking for more than that, more than 400,000. So minimum wage talks collapse again as labor rejects 60,000 naira. That's still on the Punch newspaper uh, on page 18. Minimum wage. Um, honestly speaking, like I always say, I sympathize with labor. If labor is insisting on the 500,000 naira to pay, Hey, it may really not be out of a place. Taking cognizance of the high inflation that we have in the in society, the interest rates, and all manners of uh, skyrocketing prices uh, that the labor people are confronted with. But the question we ask ourselves is that uh, is economics in all monetary policies able to solve the problem that we have in our hands today? The answer is no. Uh, if you give labor the 100,000 that they are asking for, other than the 60,000 and all that, I see those things. Like, um, that might not solve the problem of uh, the labor and the average material process. I would rather want to see a situation in which you find a more holistic approach to solving this, um, to solving this uh, problem in such a way that the government and labor will get a real situation in our hands. Well, come to look at it. Where will the government be able to raise the necessary funds? to be able to pay the 100,000 minimum wage to the workers all over the country. We have the federal workers, we have the state workers, and we also have the local government workers. All of them will be deriving from, all of them will be looking for the federal government for the payment of, uh, of uh, this money. If the government is able, like I say, uh, revive agriculture, uh, cut down on transportation, uh, um, train inflation, and then study the value of the naira, and then also ensure that um, there is an inflow of a foreign exchange into the country, and also embark in a way, so to say, a kind of massive, massive importation of food stock from outside the country, wheat, rice, beans, grain, yam, and all that in the next six months. So as to cash the prices of food stock all over the country, I think they could win my detector. Uh, for it. So labor and the federal government and the state government and the local government will require to sit down and then put their heads together and design a policy or embark on the road that will make it possible for us to be able to have a new situation between labor and then the federal government. Uh, we are not throwing money at the problem in our, we have in our house today. My name is necessarily for the problem. In fact, I suspect that it might aggravate the situation because by the time you begin to pay me for the other thousand naira, the ordinary person and there are more in number who are in the unorganized service sector, we also increase the prices of goods and services that they sell or that they provide the prices. And then we will back to square one. If no ones are where we before the minimum wage was raised to the other thousand naira. Mm. Okay. In March, I think on the 12th of March or something like that, uh, Senator uh, Ahmed Ningi was uh, uh, suspended uh, from the Senate because he made some utterances or observations about the budget and he talked about padding, uh, which was up to like uh, 3.7 trillion or so uh, naira. And he was suspended. Now he has been recalled. They have pardoned uh, Senator Ningi. And the headline here on the Business NG is saying Senate pardons, recall suspended Senator Abdul Ningi. What is your take? Well, I think um, the recall of Abdul Ningi is a welcome development. The Senate is supposed to be a platform 
for the debate of uh, national issues, for people to be able to air their views without the fear of being intimidated, harassed, or punished uh, unnecessarily. Uh, it is uh, uh, the best form of uh, uh, freedom of speech to be tolerated on the front of the National Assembly. So when you begin to apply the speech to whatever senators you don't uh, agree to their opinion or to their contribution on the front of the National Assembly, then you are in a way trying to cover, you are in a way trying to stifle uh, independent opinion, and then you are in a way trying to ensure or um, make sure to control people not to be able to speak their mind when they are in the floor of the National Assembly or the State of Assembly, not even the local government the parliament. So I welcome the suspension, I mean the the report of Senator Ningi and I do hope that both parties, both Senator Ningi and then the Senate will have now one or two lessons from all of this. This will not be the first time that this will be happening in the country. We just spoke that uh, it will not continue to happen. But well, like I said, for God's sake, don't fight to people's opinion. Uh, let the thousand uh, uh, flowers bloom, and then the uh, hundred or a thousand burden of person to also contend on the floor of the National Assembly. People may be wrong, people may be right, but we should always uh, give them the freedom to freely assert themselves, not just before the National Assembly, but all over the country. That is how the nature is built. Okay. So there's there's been this advocacy for local government autonomy. In fact, the 36 states of the federation have been taken to court by the federal government to leave the uh, to let the local governments go, as it were, because uh, they are being strangled by the state governments. Now, even Lagos State has said that they shouldn't have been part of this because they are doing their best to give local government that autonomy that they deserve and all that. But the case is still there. So local government autonomy, Afeni Ferre has just uh, supported local government autonomy. Uh, but what, what do you think about this local government autonomy? What are the legal uh, implications, legal challenges and all that? Because we are wondering why it has to be a case in court before the government or the uh, state governments can leave uh, the local governments to function as a third tier of government covered by the constitution. Very honestly speaking, I felt embarrassed when I saw that the Assembly of the Federation I find a case in court uh, speaking um, or trying to get the Supreme Court to make a pronounce or give a ruling or give a judgment as the guys of the of the local government. Why do I say when you look at our constitution uh, and you read in this in the line, there is no doubt that the constitution has actually given autonomy to the local government all over uh, the country. That's all the cause. And I think this was under General Mohamed Iswari's uh, presidency that there was an executive order uh, giving autonomy to the local government to be able to do, I mean, uh, financial autonomy to the local government to be able to execute uh, whatever projects uh, that they might be intended to achieve at the local government uh, uh, level. The reason why the local government are no longer autonomous, or why they cannot afford themselves, or why the state government has refused to allow local government economy, economy is because there is a high indiscipline among the political class. <coughs> among the political class. So imagine, in, the, in Nigeria today, the APC, the government at the federal level, has more government, has more local government under them. So if they have more government, if they have more local government, more state under them. Why is it that they have been able to ensure or to enforce local government autonomy under in the state and the local government that they are under them? Then people say, look, the government that has been controlled by the city and the state level and the local government level, they have no, they, they don't have more state over those. What about the state and then the local government under the APC government? Why have they not been able to ensure that local government autonomy is enforced in the state under them? They are able to do it because they are the digital because the government will not send um, to see the local government. So I would rather want to see a situation in which the APC that has a better level will force taxes, local government autonomy, with respect to the state and the local government that there, before pointing at the finger at the PDC and some of these other states where they are not in control. Uh, 
And furthermore, uh, you will know that before you can win an election in this country, you must have the control of the local government. I think the governors are not allowing local government to have the autonomy. I also think that the federal government might not be sincere with this um, a cry for local government autonomy because most of the people in politics believe that if they don't have control of the classes, it will be difficult for them to win elections at the state level and then at the federal level. That is the reason you find out. Well, it's unfortunate. We have uh, we seem to have lost uh, the audio of um, uh, Mr. Kola Wale there, and we're talking about on the headlines uh, that are on the national dailies this morning. We have Ningi uh, being returned. We have uh, local government autonomy, autonomy. That was what he was talking about. Uh, we also uh, would have loved to talk about the 290 million scandal that rocked the culture ministry uh, with him. And then uh, the fact that uh, um, the Senate has passed uh, the bill to revive the Nigeria, we hail the national anthem. If you cannot sing it, go and try to learn it right now, the Nigerian national anthem. It's, it's up, but we, we've spoken extensively about the Nigerian national anthem being changed from the new one to the old one. Uh, but um, if we're changing the national anthem, one thing I failed to also uh, talk about is that if the old system is good, if, the, if there are old things that we can, we can bring back and make our country better, we should bring them back as well. For instance, the governance of uh, the olden days was not the presidential system that we have nowadays. We had some kind of presidential system, we had some kind of system rather, uh, where there was a, a president and there was a prime minister and the federating units or at least the zones were we were working as independent zones. We had the southwest, we had the southeast, we had north and all that. And if that worked the way it worked, that's why uh, the Awolowers of this world were able to give um, free education to the southwest and had, today we, 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 can, we can safely say that the southwest is the most educated in Nigeria. Uh, the southeast has uh, the economy. Uh, the North has been said to have the, the, the power and all that, but uh, we know where the economy lies, where the, where the, uh, where the education uh, lies and all that. So if we can return to this national anthem of old, because it defines us as a people, it really tells our story and also pricks our, our consciences to do the right thing, then we can also maybe revisit some of those things like uh, the... the uh, the the zones or the the real democracy that we were, uh, we, were, we, were, we were practicing before now. So if old things can be good enough, let's bring them back. If the new things are not working, let's jettison them or rework them and make sure that our Nigeria moves higher and higher. So Nigeria, we hail the <laughs> our own dear native land. I love that anthem anyway, but that's not the reason why it should be changed because I loved it. It is, it, it is going to be changed according to what they're saying because, like I said, it is really defining us as a people and pricking our consciences to do the right thing. But I, like I called on the national orientation earlier on, we need to have a re-engineering of our our psyche, uh, the way we reason, the way we think about Nigeria, our patriotism needs to be built from the scratch. So what are we doing also after changing the national anthem uh, for schools <coughs> or for students in primary, secondary schools and tertiary institutions who have that respect for the Nigerian nation, to have that love for the Nigerian nation because it goes beyond singing national anthem. How many schools sing national anthem as something that is so, so important? A lot of schools have resorted to having their own personal anthems and they sing that even more often than the national anthem with more respect than the, nas than the national anthem. So what are we going to do in that regard to make sure people begin to see their country as a country that they need to love all the time? So, well, congratulations to them, or to the people who are making the policies and making sure that... Um, things change for the better. Some are advocating that the name Nigeria should be changed, not because it's not good enough, but simply because uh, the person who suggested the name was someone's a colonial master's girlfriend, 
<laughs> you know, that's why they don't want the name to continue. It's from the colonial masters. How many things from colonial masters have we even jettisoned? In fact, I'm talking to you now in English language. I should be using a Kajuk language, which is my own, or I should be using Yoruba or Hausa or something, but I'm using English language. Why? Because it's good enough for our diversity. We may not be able to learn all the languages in Nigeria so that we can function. I cannot learn even the Yoruba that I'm staying in. I cannot even learn it. So if I need to travel to Abuja, I learn Hausa. I need to travel to um, uh, Imo State, I learn Igbo. I need to travel to, even if I go to the southeast, I could go to a Bonyi state and they speak a different kind of Igbo. They speak, uh, let me not even call it how we call it, but they speak a different kind of Igbo that some, the regular Igbo people do not even understand. If you go to Cross River State, for instance, it's almost like every local government speaks their own uh, language. In fact, there is a local government where you go to, a village where you go to, where the women speak differently from the men. It's like speaking English and speaking Pidgin English. You both understand themselves, but there are words that you would use, they would know this one is speaking Pidgin and this one is speaking English. You just understand yourself. So that's the reason we're using English in uh, Nigeria. And when people are saying that we should use indigenous languages, I just ask myself, which of the languages are we going to use? How are we going to merge all these languages together, together and form one language that we can use as a, a language of communication in Nigeria? So it means that English is good for us as a diverse uh, community uh, which came together to call ourselves Nigeria. So there are some things that are good, whether they are coming from the colonial masters or not. If they are good for us, we should adopt them. Democracy, the way we are practicing it, may not be a, an African thing. Obasanjo has been saying it, some experts have been saying it, that we might practice democracy, but let us tailor it to our own cultural tradition. Our, we being Africans, we being Nigerians as a people, we should look for a system of democracy that will work for us. We should not look for a system where one person will be talking uh, for the rest of the people we should have a democracy because government uh, that is democratic is a better government than anyone because everybody gets to have a say. But how much of that say? How, what are we supposed to be doing and all that? So we should look for ways to make democracy African and not just African to make it Nigerian. So what are these things that we need to put in place? Now we're talking about national anthems. So we do hope that things will change for the better. Those old things that are good for us should be returned. Those new things that are not good for us should be removed. If policies are coming up, we can know that you are bold enough, especially this administration is bold in taking decisions. Yeah, we give it that uh, much. Very, very bold, very fearless. Uh, but um, I usually say bravery is not uh, the ability to face danger. Bravery is uh, the ability to know when not to get involved. That is it. So you know when not to get involved. Whether you, sh you need to run away, uh, that also is bravery. You're brave enough to run away to fight another day. Uh, it doesn't mean that when you run away, you're always very weak. So it's not just facing danger, imminent danger that will lead to a loss of life. That not necessarily is my own kind of bravery. So if we find that we are brave enough to face that danger, then the ability to discern when we need to retreat is also bravery to me. So if you make a decision and you're brave enough, people are applauding you and you find out it's not working, be brave enough to retrace your steps. Uh, that is good enough for Nigerians as well. So we shouldn't have a system that was working and now having a system that is acceptable globally but it's not working for us. And, and then we shouldn't have a system where we need to be dictated to by other people. The IMF tells us Go and impoverish your people and we do it because we want a loan. Uh, the World Bank says the same thing. The United Nations says another thing. Uh, powers that be will support one thing and condemn that same thing in another place. Um, when the Russian government came back to power, they said it was a bad thing uh, because the election seemed to be rigged. People were talking about it. When our own came to power and people were complaining, they were applauding and all that. It, I'm not saying it was rigged, but... Uh, they seem to be working and saying things with two sides of the mouth. Yeah, the same 
uh, thing that is happening between Russia and Ukraine, Russia gets blamed, and uh, now Israel and Gaza, uh, Gaza gets blamed, even if America is not talking about it. So we should know that we have our own backs and try to decide some things for ourselves. This is how Nigeria, Nigeria has to work. Unfortunately, we uh, intended to have so many other guests that will talk about the scorecard of um, the federal government. Uh, we're seeing some papers are carrying the fact that the presidency is denying that the, uh, this, the, the president is not going to address the National Assembly. We are going to see that, whether that news is true or not. The first information we had was that the Joint National Assembly seating today will be addressed uh, at 9 o'clock or just slightly over 9 o'clock by the president. We are going to still monitor that to see what happens. Let's see who is saying the truth, whether those who said that the president was going to talk or the people who said the president was not going to talk. But be on the lookout to hear what the president uh, may say or might say uh, if, uh, if he does address the, the public or the National Assembly. And let's get some takeaways because we will be talking about those ones very much tomorrow on the show. But in the meantime, Nigeria, we hail thee, our own dear native land. Though tribe and tongue may differ, in brotherhood we stand. Nigerians all are proud to say or call our sovereign motherland. Let us be proud to call our Nigeria our motherland. No matter how diverse we are, no matter how aggrieved we may be, this Nigeria is our Nigeria. This Nigeria is where we can crow as a cock and know that it is our country. There are things that you cannot do outside. There are people who have been deported after 50 years to their home countries, even though they have been called citizens of that country for the longest of time. They had all their children there, they got married there, they had jobs there, they had futures there. Some of them don't even have contacts with their, their home country anymore, and they have been removed from that country, separated from their families and sent to their homes, uh, which is uh, wherever that may be. So if you're Nigerian, whatever other passport you are carrying and the citizenship you are carrying, the first and the best is your country, and that is Nigeria. And we cannot make it grow if we do not contribute our quotas to making it work for us. Whatever we are doing from our little corners, let's know that it, it has a, an impact on the, the wider uh, society, which is Nigeria. Don't think that because you are a pure water seller, as we call the people who hawk water, sachet water all around, and, uh, and then you are selling at outrageous prices, you are doing better than a, 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 a senator or a, a politician that steals a, a billion naira. You are the same thing because it so shows that if you are, uh, if you are stealing 10 naira, 20 naira, it is because that is what you have seen. If you are given the opportunity to see more, you will steal more. So don't blame anybody else if you are doing the exact same thing on a small scale, waiting for opportunity to do it bigger. All these people that we are accusing today that they are doing X, Y, Z, they came from among us and some of them are being encouraged by us. You go to the Senate with the same car and come out with the same car, your community might even stone you to death because, you know, you didn't show working, you didn't behave like your colleagues. You came, you went with the same car, you came out with the same car. The same house you were living before you went into the Senate is the same house you're living today. What happened to you? You have no sense, this and that. And then your colleagues will be given chieftaincy uh, titles here and there. We are the ones encouraging this. And this is why um, architect Nyai Tok would always say that the office of the citizen is the greatest office. And all experts say the same thing, that it's the greatest office in any country, if the citizens don't sit up, their country will likely remain the way it is all the time and there is nothing that can be done about it. Well, we'll give you time to prepare this morning to see what is going to happen from 9 o'clock. We'll give you time to enjoy the fact that today uh, we celebrate 25 years of uninterrupted uh, power supply. Oh, <laughs> I think power supply. Uninterrupted uh, uh, democracy. It started in 1999 when the the federal the Olusegun the president was uh, um, sworn into power, 
and it has continued every year. It used to be Democracy Day until it's, it was moved to June 12 because of obvious reasons, and now it is just handover day. So after four years of this administration, the handing over will be done on this day uh, in 2027, uh, if that is the case that is going to be. Handing over to himself or to somebody else, uh, that is the present uh, president now. Uh, we've also seen uh, the, 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 the federal government complaining. I'm talking about what is happening in labor and all that. The federal government is complaining that there really isn't any money, even though Nigerians are not believing it because of some things that are also very obvious, uh, how money is being spent and who is spending what money and, you know, all those things. Uh, even to the extent that the, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs has said that the reason there are no ambassadors up till now one year after is because Nigeria has no money to even give them transport to their to their respective uh, uh, countries that they're supposed to go and be ambassadors in and talk for Nigeria so it means that Nigeria is not re being represented in any country uh, that the ambassadors should be and they are not at that point it's like having a national assembly without any representative because their people cannot give them transport to go there and talk for them that's what is happening here. So if we don't have anybody in America to represent us, it has to be the president going there all the time or the vice president going there all the time. Or, yeah, so we don't have a, a, an ambassador in Canada. We don't have an ambassador in Britain. We don't have an ambassador anywhere else. I'm just giving us an instance. The federal government has said ambassadors are not being appointed because they have no transport. They have no money to maintain uh, the embassies in these foreign countries. So that's why they have no ambassadors for now. Well, thank God we have 40-something ministers. They can do these things and they can always go out and represent us in uh, the countries that uh, we are supposed to have these embassies in. But I'm not sure it speaks well of our country. Um, a country like Nigeria does not have ambassadors because we have no money. It's, I don't know how it sounds to you, but it doesn't sound really great to me. Uh, but like I said, we'll leave you to have your rest. We'll leave you to have um, uh, to think about Nigeria. And while you're thinking about what the government is doing, think about what you have been doing for the last 25 years that uh, should have taken this democracy to where it should be. How many times in these 25 years have you voted? How many times have you campaigned, you know, for people to come out and vote? I'm not just saying voting yourself alone, but in your community, how many people have you spoken to to see the need to come out and vote? And after the election, what is your behavior towards the outcome of this election? Uh, is it that of fighting? Is it that of uh, acceptance? Is it that of jubilation? Is it that of understanding? Whatever it is, how has your, your behavior been? How have you looked at democracy from 25 years ago till now? What is your dream for the Nigerian democracy? What do you intend to do to make sure that it continues uh, without any problems for the next 25 years and 50 years, 100 years and beyond till you also leave the face of the earth? Because like an American president said, think not of what America can do for you, but what you can do for America. So what are you doing for Nigeria to make sure that Nigeria succeeds? Are you just gathering money to Jakba, as all of us are saying? That shouldn't be the case. But whatever it is, our Nigeria, we hail thee, and we hope that you are going to succeed in everything. I'm talking to Nigeria. That includes me and you and everybody else. Congratulations, Nigeria, for 25 years of uninterrupted democracy, before I say power supply anymore, <laughs> democracy. We do hope anyway that we are also going to have uh, to celebrate maybe 25 years of un uninterrupted power supply as well, even since I've been mentioning it. 50 years of uninterrupted power supply. I do hope that we are going to also have alternatives to whatever we are facing as challenges now in the power sector, in the energy sector, everywhere in Nigeria. Let's be looking for alternatives. Let's be looking to go tech. Let's be looking to go, you know, technological, whatever other options that we have on our table. But we will succeed and that takes you and me. Thank you so much for being a part of our show this morning. This is where we are going to draw the curtain. We're ending early this morning, but we're hoping to return tomorrow with everything you need to know about 25 years after and so many other things uh, that we need to discuss about.
In the meantime, on behalf of the entire crew of a good morning or uh, breakfast in uh, Plus TV Africa, I say thank you for being there. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Bye for now.